Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, as they're bringing out the coffee and desserts, I thought we might get settle, set with the, uh, the, the, our, our keynote speaker, who I am very pleased and privileged to announce is Dr. Dan Baldor, whose uh, father's sitting in the back and part of, part of the group of uh, the excellent family physician, community physicians that we have at UMass. I'm, I'm pleased to tell you Dr. Baldor is a surgical resident, um, but also a, a sort of a polymath. He does a lot of different things. Uh, he's the chief res surgical resident at UMass, and terrific at that. He has a BA from uh, UMass Boston in political science, and both a, a medical degree and a master's in public health from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He's a lieutenant in the United States Navy, and will return to active duty in the 2nd Medical B Battalion and Camp Lejeune with the Marine Corps when he graduates this year. Um, he is, uh, he's a true son of Worcester. He grew up in the area, and that's part of his story, and so I think you'll find that it resonates a lot with what we've been hearing about tonight in terms of uh, community and public health and those interests. I'm sure they've rubbed off uh, all along the way from, uh, from his father. I would, I would say that, um, I would say that uh, he is a, a man of many, of many talents. He's a, a is a superb actor. He reminds me, and when he roasts all of the faculty of Peter Sellers, actually playing many different roles. He's really extraordinary at it. He's also a, a fairly keen hunter um, and uh, a terrific father. He builds the, the furniture for his children and all sorts of uh, all sorts of other articles. And it turns out he fancies that he can take care of, of car engines as well. He has. <laughs> one of those mounted on his wall. So uh, it is with uh, great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Baldor to you tonight for a talk that I find a really an excellent talk. And we'll have some questions at the end of it. All right, perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Whalen. Um, I want to thank the Worcester District Medical Society for this opportunity to speak. And congratulations, Dr. Shukla and Falmer, for um, your awards tonight. This talk was a grand rounds that I gave as part of a graduation requirement. It was a topic that was assigned to me. So when I, I got it, I, you know, I didn't know what to make of it. But the more that I dove into this topic, I realized that there's a story we're not talking about. There's a story worth telling that I wanted to tell. I'll be presenting this through the lens of my training, which Dr. Whalen brought up my BA in political science and my master's in public health, and less so my MD tonight. So I hope to present things you've never seen before for a fresh take on a topic that we've heard a lot about. To borrow language from the field of criminal justice, means, motive, and opportunity. We've talked a lot about the means and opportunity of the early epidemic, getting opiates by prescription. But rarely, if ever, do we discuss the societal motives, the why. Why did people start using them en masse? Sure, opiates were the dynamite, but what was the spark? Before we begin, I'm required by UCMJ to say this. The views expressed are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Okay, let's begin. More U.S. residents have died from opiate overdoses than, during, than were killed during World War II. Now, our parents and grandparents probably experienced this statistic different than us. I have heirlooms that have been passed down to me from family who serve, but this is not personal to me. When I think about the epidemic, these are the people that I think about. These are people I went to school with and grew up with who are no longer with us because of this. The girl way on the you know, screen left over there, patient right, um, she lived two houses down from me. We went to elementary school, middle school, high school. I played with her on the street. I knew her sister, her family very well. The young man next to her, I went to his, um, after high school, I'd go to his house because I didn't have video games, um, but he did. And he let me play video games uh, all night, and I would stay up all night at his house. It was awesome. And the other two, um, you know, they were sort of in my circle of friends, but not anyone I really knew um, personally. You know, so this is not something that's a problem of, of abscesses and endocarditis, right? This is more personal. I think a lot of us out here actually know and connect to people who are involved in this epidemic, maybe more so than we'd actually care to admit. 
So let's start with the first of the four waves of the opiate epidemic. Let's call this the spark. Okay. The first wave is broadly believed to be due to the aggressive marketing and prescribing of Oxycontin during this time, starting in 1996. This is when Oxycontin came to market. This is certainly true, and we'll review data that has emerged from litigation, but I don't believe this to be the entire picture. Pharmaceutical companies exist to make profits while bringing drugs to market. They sell a product to make money, and I don't think we should levy normative judgments on them for that. It's literally why they exist and what they'll do forever. Now, in our academic world, translational research is for bringing basic scientific discovery into clinical practice. In the business world, marketing research is for bridging the gap between having a product and selling a product. Through litigation and freedom of information requests, much of OxyContin's pre-market research documents are freely available to view. OxyContin would come to market in 1996 as a Schedule II controlled substance. Now, because they are a business, Purdue measured the effect that varying state policies would have on sales in order to target their advertising dollars for mass maximum efficacy. They wanted to know which states were going to buy this drug and which states weren't. They looked at states that mandated what are known as triplicate policies, which are a policy requiring three receipts for prescribing a Schedule II controlled substance, one by the provider, one that goes to the pharmacy, and one that goes to the state oversight body. It adds a layer of burden and oversight, what economists might call a nudge to prevent illicit overprescribing of Schedule II substances. Purdue wanted to know, for example, should they target their advertising campaign in states like New York, which had triplicate protective policies, or were they better serve pushing Oxycontin in states like Ohio that didn't have triplicate policies? They concluded, physicians in the triplicate state did not respond positively to the drug since it's a class two narcotic, which would require triplicate prescriptions. Therefore, only a few would ever use the product and for them, it would be on a very infrequent basis. Pre-market researchers recommended that the product should only be positioned to physicians in non-triplicate states, i.e. less regulated states. Our research suggests that the absolute number of prescriptions they, the physicians in triplicate states, would write each year is very small and probably not be sufficient to justify any separate marketing effort. Now we can see the downstream effect of this marketing using CMS data, where non-triplicate states in red here, those without protective policies, had sig significantly more payments made to OxyContin than triplicate states. OxyContin launched in 1996, and you can see the downstream effect even in 2013 to 2016. If we look at opiate mortality difference between triplicate and non-triplicate states, it's telling. You can see the vertical line where OxyContin was launched in 1997, and you can see the downstream. Um, the mortality rates are the same, rather, until 2002, where there is the start of a statistically significant difference in mortality, where we saw mortality in non-regulated states like Ohio take off. Researchers who looked at this comment it is not surprising that these mortality effects are delayed given the expansion of OxyContin promotion sales over time and the FDA's relabeling in 2001 that expanded, expanded its market for chronic use. In addition, it would take time for a person to transition from an initial prescription for OxyContin to dependence and an overdose. Now I agree, this makes sense, but is there something else going on here? What happened between 1996 and 2002? Is increasing supply the only aspect at play? The question I had, was while increasing supply of opiates is necessary for an epidemic to take off, is it sufficient by itself to cause the epidemic? Or are there other forces at play? To answer this question, let's take a detour and talk briefly about car tires. Akron, Ohio is known for its tires. It once hosted corporate offices for four of the big five tire companies, Goodrich, Goodyear, Firestone, and General Tire. 68%, I'll repeat that, 68% of total wage earners in the tire industry were from Akron, Ohio. Akron was once referred to as the rubber capital of the world. You can see here the share of employment that rubber workers made up in the economy of Akron and the slow decline over time. In the 1980s, about 12% of the working population was involved in the tire manufacturing process. It was down to about 2% in 2007. This followed a broader trend of job loss in the manufacturing sector in all of Ohio, which you can see on the right. Note that around 2001, both Akron and the state overall sees a steeper drop in manufacturing jobs than in previous years. If we, move, if we zoom out even further, we can see the sudden severe loss of manufacturing jobs at the regional level across the entire Midwest that occurs shortly after 2001. 
This is data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Ohio employment in plastics and rubber fell by over 20,000 jobs during this time. Lastly, if we then overlay disability claims in Ohio, looking specifically at men 18 to 65, those who typically occupy the manufacturing sector, we see a reciprocal increase in disability claims, which also started exactly in 2001. So what happened here? Does it have anything to do with the opiate epidemic? If I ask anyone here what they remember from 2001, I guarantee your first thought is 9-11. But that's not the story we're going to talk about today. I want to talk about a significant policy change in the US and how that's an important why in the story of how the opiate epidemic came to be. To be crystal clear, as we move forward, I am not demonizing or praising the economic policies of the US government. I am simply trying to look at the opiate epidemic through a different lens by describing what else was going on during this time. What happened in 2001 that led to such significant manufacturing job losses and increased disability claims at a time when prescription opiates were becoming broadly available in unregulated states like Ohio? Well, according to the Ohio State University John Glenn College of Public Affairs and the Carnegie Endowment, the 400,000 plus jobs lost in the early 2000s in Ohio were due to three dominant factors. China's accession of the World Trade Organization, automation, and the Great Recession. China's accession into the World Trade Organization seems to have a broader effect in the region, while Ohio was uniquely positioned to be more affected than other states by the double tap of automation replacing its jobs, and that's specific to its industries, like tires. We'll talk about these things briefly, then I promise we will get back to opiates. But you need to understand how important this story, which we never talk about, is for the opiate epidemic. Prior to 2001, the US did not have normal trade relations with China. That just meant we had high tariffs on imported goods in order to protect manufacturing and agriculture in the US. In October of 2000, Congress granted permanent normal trade relations status with China on their entering the World Trade Organization. And in December 2001, China joined the World Trade Organization and tariffs became virtually non-existent. To return to our prior story about tires, China, for example, is now the world's leading producer of tires. This contributes in a large way to the job loss felt within Akron, Ohio. And I chose Ohio to discuss specifically because Ohio was also uniquely exposed to the effects of automation. So it got a double tap to its industries. So let's get back to opiates. What were the effect of these trade policies on mortality? And specifically, do changes in tariffs predict opiate deaths? And what does that mean? This is an article from the American Economic Review, one of the oldest economic academic journals started in 1911 with a high impact factor. I only say this because I'm not an economist, and I assume many of you aren't as well, but I want to qualify the analysis I'm about to present as coming from a reputable, peer-reviewed source. The authors, Pearson Schott, looked at county-level data in the US to answer this question. First, they measured how much tariffs changed for each industry after trade relations normalized for steel, rubber, computer chips, timber, et cetera. Second, they calculated the weighted average of this change by multiplying it by the percent of workforce for that industry. So basically, how much the tariff change for steel times how many steel workers were in the county. Next, they combined this value for all industries within a county to create a county level effect of tariff changes. Basically, they combined the effect of steel, rubber, timber, et cetera, within each county. They did this for more than 3,000 counties. And this unique value assigned to a county showed which were affected the least and the most by putting them into quartiles from lowest to highest. You could see which areas were hit the hardest. They then used these quartiles to predict deaths of despair, defined as deaths from drug overdoses, suicide, and alcoholic-related liver disease, while controlling for things like opiate availability and policies to isolate the effect that these tariffs had. These charts here show the year-on-year -year effect that an increase in tariffs had on outcomes. You can see that prior to 2001, deaths of despair are stable. Beyond this, they increase in areas affected by tariff changes, and this combined mortality outcome is driven only by drug overdoses, not suicide, not alcoholic-related liver disease. The regression models show that for every interquartile increase in tariff effect, the mortality rate from drug overdoses increases about two to three deaths per 100,000 people every year. Let me say that again. For every interquartile increase in tariff effect, the mortality rate from drug overdoses increases about two to three deaths per 100,000 people every year after controlling for opiate availability. When they isolate who these affect the most, it's white males and to a lesser extent white females. 
Now, this makes sense according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Males account for 68% of U.S. manufacturing employment during this time, despite being only 49% of the population, and 84% uh, of the manufacturing pro uh, industry is white. Now, we can have a separate conversation about inequity, but that's not the point. Incidentally, white working-aged males have the highest rates of opiate overdoses. To be sure, the interquartile increase in tariff effect is associated with year-on-year -year increases in unemployment, decreases in labor force participation rates, it's a second box, increases in disability claims and disabled workers. How those interact with opiate overdoses is complex, but I think the macroeconomic events and associations are hard to ignore when we look at it all together. The bottom line is that changes in economic opportunity, not just the lack of economic opportunity, but the change, the loss of economic opportunity predicts drug overdose deaths in a dose response manner at the county level with strong correlation. Here's the summation of my thoughts on the first wave of the opiate epidemic. This is ecological data and subject to the potential for the ecological fallacy, but I find it hard to ignore the trends. I believe that unemployment driven by this change in trade policy and the proliferation of automation led to despair and opiate uptake at a time when prescription opiates were becoming readily available for individuals in non-triplicate states like Ohio. I do not believe the demographic overlap between those who lost their manufacturing jobs and those who died of opiate deaths, that being white working aged males during this first wave is a coincidence. Means, motive, and opportunity. The spark. During the second wave, prescribing patterns changed and the dynamics of the epidemic changed as well. Did we as physicians clean our house and our own contribution? I think so. But is there more to this story too? Let's find out. The second wave began in 2010 with increased use of heroin and a transition away from prescription opiates. It's a story we've all heard. You can see here from a congressional effectiveness study of opiate policies, diversion of prescription opiates, meaning the illicit use of prescription opiates, increased as we prescribe more during the first wave up until 2011, and then it starts dropping after that. This second wave transition to heroin from prescription-based opiates is coincident with a decline in opiate prescribing generally, but also with the reformation of Oxycontin to an abuse deterrent formulation. This change in prescribing practice and the formulation change precede federal policy by years. So for me, this suggests that medical providers did clean house when they recognized the problem. Now many people believe, uh, now many believe that people began self-medicating or turning to heroin from prescription Oxycontin as the supply of abusable Oxycontin began to dwindle. I believe that to be a, true, 100%. But what's puzzling me is that the demographic of users changes dramatically. Examining the years 2012 to 2014, the age distribution of hospitalized patients for opiate pill overdose had its largest peaks in the 50 to 64 year old group. Meanwhile, the peak age for heroin overdose admissions was 20 to 34 years old. And what's even more fascinating to me is that the uptake of heroin by this younger cohort precedes peak prescribing in 2011 and precedes the reformation of Oxycontin into the abuse deterrent, potent, abuse deterrent formulation. There is a sudden and stark increase in heroin overdose hospitalizations in 2009 for individuals aged 20 to 34. Let me show you what I mean in this timeline. If we look at the chart showing peak prescribing, you can see the uptake of heroin by young users in red in 2009, preceding the release of abuse deterrent formulation and peak prescribing by one to two years. For me, this calls into question the hand-waving idea that people transitioned to heroin from Oxycontin. First, it's clear that the individuals overdosing on Oxycontin were not the same individuals overdosing on heroin because of the drastic age difference. Trading Oxycontin for heroin does not shave off two decades of someone life, someone's life. Second, the timeline doesn't even support supply side issues, that it was more difficult to acquire prescription opiates which would necessitate such a transition. So what happened to individuals aged 20 to 34 between the years 2008 and 2009? Well, heck, I was that age then. Let me tell you my story. This is me, a fresh college graduate with a BA in political science, graduating into a free falling economy that was precipitated by the housing market crash. This was much of my face during the Great Recession, 
I was volunteering at a health policy department at Tufts because Obamacare was hot at the time, but there were simply no paying academic pol or policy jobs or government jobs. Despite what I may have said in my medical school interviews, this was the year I decided to become a doctor. Yes, I had heady reasons for wanting to go into conflict in medicine and public health through the military, but in reality at that time, I couldn't get a job. It was that simple. I come from a family of healthcare providers and I understood the economic safety of working in medicine. I had all the institutional knowledge and resources to figure out how to become a doctor. I also knew that I could hide out in academia while the recession blew over by living off of student loans. You see, I spent months trying to get an academic research or government job in policy to no avail. I was too junior and grant funding dried up. I ultimately gave up and broadened my search. I was desperate, but there were simply no good paying entry level jobs. Ultimately, I ended up finding a job traveling the country, putting on laser shows in elementary and middle school as a children's entertainer to save for a pre-med program. It was bad. I'll never forget the job ad. Are you part rock star? Are you part motivational speaker? Are you part scientist? Yes, yes, and I could talk my way out of the last. I got an interview and borrowed my then girlfriend, now wife's car to drive from Massachusetts to New Jersey for a job interview at a small hotel the next day. If you don't know what desperation looks like, this was humiliating. I, to this day, can't believe my wife let me borrow her car and then ultimately married me. That job turned into the, the two best years of my life. But for all my talk of having fun being, quote, laser Dan, I can't express enough the shame I felt sending that application in because it had felt like I had failed. Now, this isn't a sob story. I became a doctor. Here I am, right now, waxing poetically about US policy to a society of physicians in the Northeast. I survived the recession and I made it. But what about the people who didn't have access to institutional knowledge? What happened to them from the years 2008 and 2009? The girl on the right, the one that I grew up with on my block, well, she got pregnant and had a kid senior year. That was the early 2000s. Here's your senior quote. This is for my baby girl and everyone who said I couldn't make it. You see, even though we lived in the same block in a nice neighborhood, her house was different than mine. She and her sister lived at her grandparents' house because her mother and father couldn't afford to support her. Her uncle was a drug addict and lived in the basement. Whereas I had institutional knowledge and resources to navigate higher education, she didn't. She went to the same high school, so she knew college was important, but she didn't have anyone to guide her. She did what she saw on TV. So her version of college was taking out loans to go to the University of Phoenix. If I struggled to get a job in 2008, graduating with honors in my field from an excellent school, how was she going to make it after being swindled by a private online college that preyed on individual, individual uh, vulnerable individuals? Well, she did it. She found heroin sometime after 2008, which is when we lost touch. This public arrest record came near the end of the second wave. She ultimately died lying next to her boyfriend in June of last year from a fentanyl overdose during the third wave of the epidemic, one week after my wife gave birth to a daughter. Our lives were so different. I found out months later when I ran into her boyfriend and asked how she was doing. You don't know, he said. Heaven gained an angel. She left behind four kids. I opened my yearbook. This is for my baby girl and everyone who said I couldn't make it. I believe that her story is the story of the second wave that we aren't talking about. So let's go back to the beginning of the second wave. On September 29th, 2008, the stock market suffered its single biggest day loss in history as the real estate bubble popped. You can see the effect this had on unemployment. The rate from, went from six to 10% basically overnight. You can see the effect this had on housing prices as toxic mortgages were foreclosed on. So who did this affect? Is it possible that the loss of economic opportunity among a subpopulation could again lead to an increase in deaths of despair in that same group expressed through opiate use? Who is at the highest risk of losing their job? And which homeowners owed more on their mortgages on aggregate? Was it the 50 to 64 year old holding senior positions that were nearly done paying their mortgages? Or was it the 20 to 34 year old young professional new homeowners? We don't really have to wonder. Here are foreclosure rates by age group. People under 50 had the highest foreclosure rates, more so than 50 to 64 year olds, and even more so than 65 to 74 year olds. The last group here are individuals older than 75 who are for the most part less involved in the opiate epidemic, especially with re re um, respect to heroin use. 
It turns out some health economists at the University of Iowa also wanted to investigate the question I've been hinting at. Do housing prices predict opiate deaths during the second wave? They write, recently the Great Recession has had, great, uh, great, has had dramatic economic consequences nationwide. Despite research showing effects across several, several health behaviors, there's been less work on identifying state-level economic effects on drugs of despair. Excuse me. So the authors essentially built a regression model to predict opiate deaths, where each year in each US state was the unit of analysis. So for example, Massachusetts in 2010 had X unemployment rate and Y number of insured and Z opiate deaths. These were the variables they included, opiate death rate meeting home price, controls for drug availability. It was quite a large model. It was well done. And in terms of their methods, they weighted it. They did subgroup analysis. They did sensitivity and interaction effects. Um, and they looked at the time period we're interested in. The bottom line is this is actually a well done analysis. So why this model is interesting. By including state median home price while controlling for everything else we know about the social determinants of drug overdoses, they could potentially isolate the effect of the, cr the crash of the housing market bubble during this time period, which coincidentally immediately precedes the second wave of the epidemic. They found that unemployment was positively but not significantly associated with opiate deaths. They also found that an increase in median house price by $10,000 was associated with a decline in any opiate overdose death by nearly 3%. Now, that may not sound important, but in the context of the time span of the study, it can be interpreted as follows. During times when houses were not being foreclosed on, i.e. before and after the crash, there were less opiate overdose deaths. Then, when they drilled down by age group, this association of housing prices predicting opiate deaths during the crash only, holds only for those under the age of 45. It didn't affect those over the age of 45. To lend further credence to the argument that heroin uptake hit those least equipped to manage economic turbulence, we know that those with lower educational attainment have the highest rates of opiate-based mortality. While having a college degree or more saw a linear increase in deaths, those with just a high school diploma or less saw an exponential increase in deaths starting around 2009 and 2010. Lastly, and this is important for us in Worcester, and I find this very interesting, one thing we've learned since the housing market crash in 2009 is that the Northeast has lagged in its recovery compared to the rest of the country. It hit everybody, but we never bounced back. New England didn't do as well. If you look at changes in employment from before and after the recession, you can see that the Northeast shown here in blue, has much lower employment gains and much greater employment losses compared to the rest of the country. This chart's a bit busy, but it showed that this trend holds in both metropolitan and rural areas. This is US Census um, Bureau data. Now, why that's important is that the Northeast is essentially where the second wave of the epidemic hit. Compared to other states, the Northeast in both rural and urban areas has much, much higher increases in opiate overdose deaths during this time. So did the first wave have anything to do with the second wave, or are these separate events entirely? The first wave, the drug was OxyContin. The economic event was the loss of manufacturing. The affected population was individuals over the age of 45 to 50, and the location were those areas hit by tariffs. The second wave, the drug was heroin. The economic event was the housing market bubble. The affected population were those aged 18 to 45, and the location were areas most affected by the Great Recession. Well, they are related 100%. Diversion of prescription opiates played a huge role in giving young Americans a taste for poppy. The above graph shows the, graph shows the rates of first use, heroin versus prescription, and prescription opiate vastly outnumbers heroin. So why did young individuals switch so early to heroin? We've talked about motive, right? Economic despair and job loss, just like the first wave. But let's discuss means and opportunity in this group. To understand this trans transition, let's talk about avocados. During my laser days, I lived outside of LA. I grew a taste for avocado there because they are everywhere. And that makes sense because Mexican exports of avocados are over 3 billion annually and we're just across the border. Now, while I was there, I heard a news story about an avocado shortage because the Mexican cartels were taking avocados from producers and selling them on the black market. I couldn't believe it, so I looked it up and sure enough, that's a thing. Now, Seems they're getting into the lime business too. So there go margaritas. And just last month, eggs. Now I absolutely love eggs, avocado, Benedict. And if it's a weekend, maybe a Bloody Mary with a lime. And I'm willing to bet that many of you do too. 
So many of you, in fact, that a black market exists for all of those ingredients. What I learned from this is that cartels are businesses, and just like Purdue, they want to make money. They happen to deal in black markets and will meet a demand if it exists. Here's data, for, data from seizures of heroin at the southern border. Older Americans got their opiates from their physicians. Younger Americans are different. They're much less likely to interact with the healthcare system and much more likely to take risky behaviors. That's well borne out in the literature. It's no wonder then, as cartels saw an opiate demand rising in the US, they pushed into this market and the younger generation in the throes of the Great Recession and mass unemployment is with whom they interacted starting in 2009. Here's my summation of what I believe to be the complete story of the second wave of the epidemic. Again, much of this is ecological data and subject to the ecological fallacy, but I believe the associations and timelines are difficult to ignore. Individuals under the age of 45 got their first taste of opiates during the first wave through diversion. Cartels saw the opiate demand in the US increasing during the first wave and began pushing heroin around 2008 to 2009. This push coincided with the Great Recession which preferentially affected individuals 18 to 45, and particularly those ill-equipped to navigate such an economic downturn. Those young individuals who are much less likely to interact with healthcare systems and more likely to make risky decisions uptake heroin in the wake of this situation in areas hardest hit by the Great Recession, which is why the second wave occurs before peak Oxycontin prescribing and before abusable deterrent Oxycontin comes to market. In my personal opinion, means, motive, an opportunity. Now I want to close out the macroeconomics part of this talk by discussing the third wave of the epidemic, the introduction of fentanyl. If you look around, very few sources are talking about why fentanyl came to be. They'll tell you that its components come from China, and they make them in South America, and they come through Mexico, but it's hard to find a reason why they started doing this. First, the reason this is a huge problem I think we're all familiar with, it's lethal at much lower doses, so the case fatality rate of an overdose is so high. You can see the exponential takeoff of mortality as fentanyl comes to market. This is a problem we're still grappling with. So why did this happen? This is a picture of the first recreational marijuana shop opening on the East Coast, right here in Worcester County on Route 9 in Leicester. Here's a quote from the owner. We figured we could see between 600 and 1,000 people, and we were at the top end of that, he said, adding that there were conservatively still 200 to 300 people in line when he left the facility just after 1.30 p.m. This shut route dined down the day that it opened. To say there was pent up demand being met would be an understatement. Now this store was part of a larger wave of recreational marijuana legalization across the US starting in 2013, which is incidentally when fentanyl entered the US black market. Now I just got through demonstrating that cartels are businesses. Is it possible that a decrease in black market demand for marijuana with mass legalization has changed the supply side economics of the opiate trade? The vast majority of marijuana in the U.S. came from Central and South American cartels prior to recreational marijuana legalization. Well, Congress seems to believe so. Changes in the illegal drug markets in the United States and Canada for marijuana legalization, increased demands for opiates, especially synthetic opiates, and changing patterns of use of methamphetamine and other drugs have contributed to the drug trafficking organization's continued evolution. And if you look at import data from the border, the pattern is clear. Here's how much marijuana and fentanyl is being seized at the border over time. I normalized the data reported by the government on kilograms seized for each because the weight per dose is so different. And they only give three years, but the pattern is still telling. As marijuana imp imports decrease, fentanyl imports increase. While this is difficult to prove, the evidence suggests to me that the increased supply of fentanyl may be nothing more than the pivot of a black market business trying to maintain its bottom line while its demand for marijuana falls off. Okay, let's change gears because around this time, federal policies to address opiate, the opiate epidemic were coming into play. Three major policies from 2016 to 2018 occurred. The Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, or CARA, the 21st Century Cures Act, and the Support Act. Well, what did our money buy? You can see dollars spent by provisions, reduced demand, reduced supply, harm reduction provisions, etc. By far and away, the Support Act was the biggest of these bills. CARA and the 21st Century Cures Act did a few things that we're all probably familiar with, giving naloxone to first responders, initiating the infrastructure for prescription surveillance, expanding disposal sites for unwanted prescriptions, mandating DHHS develop best practice guidelines for pain management, creating research bodies, um, outreach and education, et cetera. 
Now, the Support Act expanded access in a huge way for inpatient treatment through Medicaid. Um, it expands medication assistance, prescription oversight. It's why you actually have to review prescribing history now when you're writing for prescription opiates. It's this act. And it also worked to prevent importation through the mail. A side note here, the dark web um, has allowed for smuggling to occur through the mail in a big way. That's a, that's a new frontier. So how's it going? Well, from 2016 to 2019, deaths involving opiates increased, but the annual rate of increase slowed down. We began flattening the curve until 2020 when there was another sudden exponential jump. Importantly, however, deaths from prescription opiates really dropped off while we were flattening the curve. That's the light blue line on your screen here. This suggests that policies are having an effect on the hospital side, but the problem remains fentanyl. The Congressional Budget Office writes, a variety of factors may have contributed to increased opiate involved mortality in 2020, including greater demand for opiates due to the stresses of the pandemic and disconnection from treatment and other recovery supports. Evidence also indicates that opiate use became more dangerous during the pandemic because some people switched to more potent substances and increased solitary use. Now that makes a lot of sense. Through my lens, this is what I see. Just as heroin intersected with the Great Recession, I will suggest with admittedly no p-value, to be clear, that fentanyl intersected with this, a spike in unemployment due to COVID greater than the Great Recession. We see flattening of the curve turn exponential again. Now, because there was such a rapid rebound of full employment by 2021, which you can see on the right, we'd expect opiate deaths to improve as well, which is exactly what is happening. The curve is flattening again. So I think we're making headway. Now, I personally believe that we will continue, however, to have worsening numbers and deaths of despair, of which opiates are just a part, until we address worsening economic conditions for dwindling middle class and expanding lower class. To be clear on that broad assessment, which is probably controversial to a certain extent, I believe loss of economic opportunity um, is to deaths of despair what smoking is to heart disease a major modifiable risk factor, but not the only risk factor. It is, however, the only major modifiable risk factor we are not addressing head on. So here's a question. Can people be paid to not use opiates? These authors wanted to know. This was a meta-analysis of 30 RCTs measuring standard of care plus or minus a monetary incentive. The outcome was measuring weeks of continuous biochemical abstinence. Vouchers range from less than $1 today, per day to $40 per day. Here's what they found. Yes, this works for opiates. It works for everything except alcohol and to a lesser extent marijuana. The duration of time that it works doesn't really fall off the longer you go. And there's a dose response where the more you give, the stronger the effect. For me, this is even more evidence that economic inequity is a very important modifiable risk factor reflecting on how and why the opiate epidemic came to be. Was it a toxic, a toxic drive for profit by a single pharmaceutical company? Physicians looking to bill more. Was it economic inequality and despair from globalization? Inequity and in access to higher education? Was it chronic pain patients? What about transnational black markets and changes in domestic drug policy? Drug wars, which we didn't even touch on? To me, deaths of despair are an organic adverse outcome of an imperfect system of which, of, which, of which opiates are just a part. I think they are predictable and preventable, but they are just the symptom of a bigger problem. I think it's convenient to look for boogeymen in a haunted house. I'm reminded of a quote from Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones. I shouted, who killed the Kennedys? When after all, it was you and me. Thank you.